how can I get the same level of performance without the side effects? So I started researching a bunch. That's why I actually made this channel about nootropic, invested tens of thousands of dollars into it, invested thousands of hours experimenting and researching. And these are the seven strongest Adderall alternatives that are as effective as Adderall, except as safe as coffee. We're gonna focus on the functional aspects such as improved working memory, improved executive function, better processing speed, better focus, better motivation, things like this. Adderall primarily works works as a dopamine and a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor as well as a VMAT2 releaser, a TAR1 agonist, affects serotonin minorly. It's three-fourths dextroamphetamine and one-fourth level amphetamine. KW6356, you never heard about this compound for no reason because it is amazing. It's so good. It is super effective, very akin to coffee in that it affects the adenosine system where adenosine essentially makes you feel sleepy highest at night, lowest in the morning. Coffee antagonizes these receptors, reducing levels of adenosine, improving levels of focus and alertness. And that's very similar to how KSW6356 works, where it gets metabolized into M6 and it only really affects the A2A receptors in contrast to caffeine, which affects the A2A and the A21. And it's because of this limited action that it is free of those side effects typical of caffeine, such as tachycardia, anxiety, all those physical sensations. Antagonizing the A2A receptors is very dopaminergic and they're primarily found within the striatum, which is the goal epicenter of the brain. And even so, antagonizing these receptors increases oxytocin, the love hormone, and that might be why after a cup of joe, you feel a little bit more friendly and social and all that good. It is fairly safe. It's past phase one and phase two clinical trials and for it to, be in those trials and be used it has to demonstrate a very high safety profile. And then for it to pass them, it has to demonstrate an even higher safety profile. I honestly find it super good. I find if there's anything that I procrastinate on, this essentially eliminates it where it's easy to get into that state of focus and flow, where if I need to be awake and alert and sharp at 6 a.m. in the morning, I can take it and I can be that way. And it's super good in that way, but you know, with great highs and great lows. And the biggest low about it is just the half-life lasts around 18 hours. So if you take it at 6 a.m., you can still notice the effects at midnight that night, even worse if you're a slow metabolizer. So that is an issue. There is a partial solution, which can be just by having specific days that you take it, right? Where you sacrifice some sleep in the short term just to be uber duper productive that day, get done everything that you need to. That being said, it is worth it. Some people do notice rapid tolerance build up with it. So they only take it a couple times a week, which is kind of similar to taking Adderall where a lot of people would just take it when they need it to study, test taking, memorization, all of that stuff. This is what the Limitless movie was actually based on where it took Bradley Cooper from a chump to a champ. <laughs> And this is Moda, which is the quintessential smart drug that a lot of people experiment with. If you look at Reddit or forums or Twitter, this is the like for like replacement for people to substitute out their Addy for something that fact with less side effects. And it is very safe, even been studied in kids multiple times. And for a drug to be used in children, it has to have demonstrated a high safety profile because of ethics, right? Moda primarily works as a weak dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It tilts the glutamate GABA balance towards glutamate, as well as it affects the orexin system, stimulating histamine release. And histamine is very important for your wakefulness system, keeping you alert, where if you take antihistamines such as Benadryl, you notice that oftentimes puts you in a drowsy, sleepy state. And that's just because histamine is so important for that. And this is very much come by ya um, to the functional aspect of amphetamine where it can improve executive function, cognitive function, through a bunch of different processes, and it's been shown to be effective in healthy populations, unhealthy, such as ADHD, narcolepsy, other neurological conditions. And the majority of the safety studies after use of 40 weeks, a year, two years, show very safe effects, little to no side effects, and even no tolerance buildup, which is kind of bizarre. Like, if you look at people's experience with Moda, there's people that report even after 10, 15 years, the same dose is still affected, that no tolerance is built up at all, which is crazy. And there's studies that illustrate this after one year, two years. So this definitely does have this effect. Guys, I have a pencil, so I, I know what I'm talking about. So I think uh, um, there's different variations on the same molecule. There's FL, Moda, or Adrafinil. A lot of people swear by this. It's kind of like a cult on the internet where some people are just mega enthusiasts of this. 
There is a drafnel, which is essentially legal everywhere. It is the pro drug to Moda. It gets converted into your liver. It does put some strain on your liver. So if you can get the other version, that's a little bit better, such as Moda. There's Armodafinil, which is a little bit more dopaminergic heavy. It's kind of like a toss between the two, what people prefer, whether that's Moda or Armodafinil. If you're more in the ADHD side of things, Armodafinil probably would be a bit better as it's more dopaminergic. Moda was like originally used for pilots to function with little to no sleep on long 18 to 20 hour flights to still be able to cognitively perform. So it is a very cool molecule. Online Indian pharmacies are your friend when it comes to this compound. This is everyone's favorite, Rastam, where it is phenylparastam, original parastam with an extra acetyl group so it can cross the blood brain barrier and impact catecholamine transmission. It has all the same effects as parastam, but additionally, it also increases neurotransmitter receptor densities. It increases acetylcholine release in the hippocampus. It works as a weak dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It also works as an A4B2 receptor agonist, so it can give you some of the euphoria, so kind of like Addy in that way, as well as it can upregulate the dopamine D2 and D3 receptors in contrast to Addy, which downregulates those. Honestly, it feels good. You're confident, you're motivated, you're sharp, you're ready to tackle the day, whatever comes. It helps you speak a little bit better as it increases verbal fluency. Some people notice rapid tolerance. They only take it once or twice a week where other people notice the effects continue over time. So they take the regular dose throughout time to have those benefits accumulate. It is prescribed for cognitive dysfunction in Russia, except you would never hear about it just because it comes from that part of the world. Doesn't mean it's not effective or safe, but just because it comes from Russia. The hydrazide version is a bit more gabinergic, even tested as an anticonvulsant. Methylphenoparacetam is a single one agonist. It's another variation on this molecule. Very interestingly, cognitive wise, except tough to find someone to synthesize it, except maybe in the future. Some recent studies came out on looking at microdosing in comparison to the typical ADHD mints, such as stimulants, and it found better health focused behaviors, better well being, increased motivation, and it was all devoid of the typical stimulant side effects, such as anxiety, increased heart rate, insomnia, poor appetite. And it's very, very interesting because it's very much a different solution. And it's something that won't degrade your brain long-term or have bad withdrawal or anything like that. And if anything, it will improve your cognitive function long-term. Like if you wanna do a fun experiment, look at Albert Hoffman speaking at 100 years old. He is so cognizant. And <laughs> where like anyone else speaking at that age is like, like, what are they saying? <laughs> but he is so sharp at that age. So I think there's absolutely something to having some microdosing or macrodosing and having your brain protected long-term as it just increases brain growth factors. If you ask anyone on this internet thing, if microdosing has improved their symptoms of ADHD, they will say yes. For helping you stop chasing the dragon, improving your focus or your mood, or even improving your memory and your learning retention overall. Microdosing here, particularly with the lysergic acid diethylamide as that's more dopaminergic at 5 UG to 20 UG is really the sweet spot as it can act as a 5-HT2 serotonin receptor agonist, which is preferentially located in the prefrontal cortex. So it can improve your executive function in that way. And it's very important for neuroplasticity, as well as this molecule is a dopamine D2 agonist, specifically affecting the dopamine D4 receptors, which are located in the striatum. So it's essentially your goal epicenter of the brain. And if you notice the trend here, all of these compounds mostly affect dopamine release in the striatum because it's very important for that intention and that action. It's more so one of those things where you can have your work day, you can enjoy your work, and then you can go outside and just live in nature and be happy that you're here. So it's definitely a good thing to look into. This is a drug you have not heard about before, not because it's ineffective, but because it seems to be mysteriously buried with 13 reports of acute liver damage after decades of use that only suddenly popped up in the same year. So it seems a little bit weird. And if you compare that to something like Tylenol, which annually has 30,000 people in the hospital for liver issues requ requiring a liver transplant or something like that, and 2,000 people get acute liver damage from Tylenol every single year in the States, it doesn't really add up. It's a little bit weird. It used to be part of the trifecta for treating ADHD within the 60s, 70s, 80s in combination with Adderall, with methylphenidate. This was the third wheel on the tricycle. What made it very different to those stimulants is those focus very much on the noradrenic system. So increased heart rate, norepinephrine, all of that, where Pimalin, 
focused very much on the dopaminergic system and it was very much devoid of those typical noradrenic effects. So it didn't really increase your heart rate or anxiety or like your fight or flight as Addy typically does. Primarily studied in kids and showed promising results. You kind of have to know somebody to get it. So it is tough to source, but it is a good option. Nonetheless, there's variations on this molecule <laughs> such as cyclodrazone. There's also N substituted derivatives um, such as these on screen. So there's a few different variations that are still available in some places. Honestly, the evidence for the potential liver toxicity is weak at best and terribly misleading at worst. This is Sam Bankman's key to riches and ticket to failure. This is Celergene, which is a very interesting compound. It has been used in children, demonstrating a similar effect profile to methylphenidate, even though it was limited by the sample size within the study, but for it to be used in kids, again, it has to be pretty safe. It functions as an irreversible monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, therefore increasing levels of domine and phenylethylamine, giving you more focus on what you need to get done. It's been used clinically for treating cognitive canine dysfunction, surprisingly, as well as cognitive dysfunction in the form of neurodegeneration for some different conditions definitely can be effective for cognitive enhancement or that stimulant property as a whole, as just because a drug is inofficially approved for a use does not mean that it is ineffective for that use. If you look at Addy, I'm sure most people would agree, Addy would also be an effective treatment for depression, MDD, even though it's not officially approved as such. With Celagene, it is metabolized in the body to L-methamphetamine and to D-amphetamine, so it has some of those same byproducts that Addy does, so we would share some of those similar stimulant properties. Interestingly though, Celagene can actually help you live longer through this monoamine oxidase B inhibition mechanism as it can stop the production of dopal, which majorly increases oxidative stress and can essentially lower lifespan. And it's been shown to do this robustly in a few studies where if you look at all the animal studies, it's been shown to increase lifespan by 34% in some studies. You don't have to worry about the cheese effect with this as it's mainly tied to the monoamine oxidase A inhibition effect and that's only an issue with Celagene at high doses. At low to normal doses that won't be an issue whatsoever. If you consider phenylparacetam a river, this next one is a stream where it is an atypical dopaminergic stimulant of bromantane where it was originally created for performance enhancement in sports or for the military and then later repurposed for treating neuroasthenia, which is essentially intense cognitive malaise in Russia. It's kind of been discontinued for the last couple of years, but it's currently in the process of being approved in Canada for treating kidney disease. The reason why it is so effective is that it's atypical to the very definition of that word in that it upregulates dopamine production by increasing dopa decarbolase and tyrosine hydroxylase. And this increase in your endogenous dopamine production lasts long term after cessation of use. So you can take this for a month then still notice the benefits roughly a month later. So it is semi-permanent effects, but also with this, there's no addiction, there's no withdrawal, there's no tolerance that develops with it. If anything, it is an effective agent to tolerance where you can pair it with stimulants because bromantane is kind of subtle on its own, except when compared with stimulants such as coffee, such as some of the other compounds on this list, that's where it can really shine because it can potentiate that stimulant as well as reduce your tolerance to it. So it's a double whammy. And so it can be a very good agent. It also increases other factors. It can increase GABAergic mediation, essentially acting as an enzylitic by increasing GABA. It affects serotonin minorly. It also increases GDNF, which could be responsible for some of its long lasting actions as other drugs that increase GDNF also have this long lasting effect after cessation. There are some worries on the internet about its pro-cancer effects or its pro-dementia effects, but these are just with doses that you would never realistically or unrealistically see anybody take at all. I think they were just trying to find the upper limit of the compounds so they just dose these mice with egregious doses. If you stay within the normal dosage range, this will absolutely not be an issue. Orally, nasally, sublingually. All of these are effective administration methods, so it kind of just depends on your preference. If you take something sublingually or nasally, it's going to give you stronger effects because it's more of a direct administration method into the blood or brain. If this works for you, it can very much be your golden egg where you can take it repeatedly. It can give you those strong dopaminergic effects and reduce your tolerance to everything else. 
and it can very much be your one all be all cure all. Um, so it can be a great compound to look into. Another example is a little bit of Nick, <laughs> which you can take in patches, zins, gum, lozenges, anything like that. I know it's a little bit controversial, except I am of the belief that nicotine at its core is not addictive. Nicotine in cigarettes is absolutely addictive as has 40 to 50 other adjunctive substances to A, increase the effects, B, make it more shelf stable, and C, make it more addictive. So that is absolutely an issue. I think nicotine gum by itself is not that much of an issue. And I think if you look online at Reddit, on Twitter, anything like that, a lot of people will say they've taken it for months and then they took a month off of it and it was no big deal. And that's been the case for me for years and years. Vaping is different, vaping is addictive, but I would say gum is not addictive. And it's a good option nonetheless. If you live in a country that is pretty strict, you know, get nicotine gum everywhere in the world. Honestly, this video was a little bit of a labor of love, so I hope that you enjoyed it. Check out this video on Canna and how it can upregulate your dopamine system significantly quickly and sustainably and why that was not a good thing for me. 